does the cholesterol we eat, the cholesterol in our food, affect the cholesterol level in our blood? This is a really common question. People ask me this all the time. And if you go online, you find the usual two extremes. On one end, cholesterol is poison, and every single human needs to be eating zero of it. And on the other end, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. Every single person should be drowning themselves in cholesterol. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you probably already know that these oversimplified views on the internet are rarely very informative. So, to clarify this issue for everybody, once and for all, I talked to Dr. Tom Dayspring. Tom is a board-certified lipidologist, and he has written entire book chapters on this topic. And let me tell you, Tom gave a master class. What you're about to see is the best explanation of this topic I've ever seen in a public-facing content. Not only did Tom answer all of the frequently asked questions, he also explained in detail why things are the way they are. And he explained it in simple terms that anybody can understand. So whether you're a scientist, a doctor, or a regular citizen interested in these topics, everybody is going to learn something here today. I learned a ton talking to him. We covered cholesterol absorption in the intestine, the effect on serum cholesterol, individual variability, the tests that are available to find out your absorption status, and finally, some actionable advice to lower your risk. So here's the video. Yeah, so I, I get this question all the time and I've gotten it for years and I, I actually made a video a couple of years ago on eggs and cholesterol and, and do eggs affect, do eggs raise serum cholesterol? Um, but I still get this question almost daily and it's, it's a source of confusion for people out there, for the public and even for some health professionals. So it's, it's really great that we get the opportunity to shed some light. Yeah. And, and of course, like most aspects of the body regulating lipids, this can get quite complex. I've actually written two very long book chapters on this topic. Now, we're not going to get into those complexities uh, for this audience, but everybody knows, hey, cholesterol is something at least I don't want to have in my arteries. Cholesterol is necessary for a certain degree to every cell in your body. So the body has powerful forces that regulates cholesterol in every cell in our body, every tissue in our body. And the body has sensors that can say, oh, this person has too much cholesterol. I got to get rid of it. The only way to, a human can get rid of cholesterol is it has to go back into the intestine and it goes out uh, with our stools in the feces. That's how the body gets rid of unwanted cholesterol. But the body also has the ability to sense, oh my goodness, this cell or that cell needs cholesterol. So I have to somehow get cholesterol to that cell. And the body gets cholesterol by either having various cells manufacturing it. If it's the liver, the liver can put it in a particle, a lipoprotein and ship it to a certain cell. But we humans all have, also have the ability to tell our intestines, we need cholesterol. If there's any cholesterol in the gut, would you please absorb it? Now, too many people think, well, the only way I get cholesterol is I'm going to eat it. And that's why everybody tells me don't eat too much cholesterol because it might not be good for your heart. Well, here's the truth. We're going to talk about absorption tonight. What that means is whatever you eat, be it a lipid, be it a protein, be it any a vitamin, any other molecule is going to go into our mouth, down our esophagus, into the stomach, and then it enters the small intestine. Finally, it enters the large intestine and it goes out your rear end. So that's how whatever you eat traverses uh, through the human body. Now, some of those molecules obviously have the ability to be absorbed. The intestine makes a decision. Whoa, we need you. We need you. So I'm going to pull you in and it pulls it into an intestinal cell. They're called enterocytes. And then the enterocyte has a decision to make. Oh my goodness, this, these molecules I've just absorbed, should I let them pass through and get into what we call the systemic circulation, the bloodstream, and then wherever it's going to go? Or should I, as the intestine, the so-called first line of defense, especially the toxic things, say, oh no, you're not getting in. You may have got into me, but I'm going to evict you right back out to the lumen of the intestine. For people who don't know, lumen is just like the opening part of a hose. It's the hole in the donut. It's what things go through as they're passing through our body. And the they, have to leave the, they have to leave the lumen and enter an enterocyte, an intestinal cell to get in. All right. So that's 
how anything gets in. Now we're talking about lipids tonight, specifically cholesterol, but I do want to talk about the lipid that everybody else knows and they talk, oh, fatty acids. There's certain types of fatty acids. Maybe I should be eating, maybe I shouldn't. Whatever fatty acid you eat, and most of them come in in the form of a triglyceride. And then when it goes down into our intestine, the pancreas secretes enzymes that break up the triglycerides into fatty acids and fatty acids get absorbed. And then your enterocyte decides what to do with them. That's all I'm talking about fatty acids tonight in general, because what I'm really dwelling on is cholesterol. Fatty acid, as, excuse me, fatty acid absorption has nothing whatsoever to do with cholesterol absorption. Even though anything can be absorbed, tonight we're talking about cholesterol absorption. The mechanisms by way cholesterol gets into the intestine, or they use very different receptors than what fatty acid used to enter the uh, intestine. So we're not really going there tonight. That's a, another complex lecture. So, all right, we're going to eat cholesterol. You mentioned eggs, but there's cholesterol in a lot of stuff. Uh, believe it or not, even uh, not many, but a few plants can even contain cholesterol. All right, but the vast majority of cholesterol that's going to be in a food that you're chewing and swallowing is not cholesterol. It's in a complex cholesterol molecule where the cholesterol molecule is attached to one of those fatty acids. When cholesterol is attached to a fatty acid, we're going to call that cholesterol ester. So that's a much bigger molecule than cholesterol because it consists of cholesterol plus of usually a long chain fatty acid. So it's a pretty monstrous molecule. So most of the cholesterol we eat are cholesterol esters. A few of the molecules of cholesterol we eat don't have a fatty acid attached to it. It's simple cholesterol. We're going to refer today, tonight to that as free cholesterol. The biological term is unesterified cholesterol, but we're going to call it free cholesterol. And it's so crucial because the only cholesterol molecule, if it gets into your gut and goes to the small intestine that can be pulled in by specific receptors is free cholesterol. Cholesterol ester, if it makes it that far, will just keep on passing right through your small intestine, right through your rectum and out in the stool. But the intestine and working with the pancreas, the pancreas knows we're eating fatty acids. So the pancreas secretes enzymes that are called lipases. Lipases just have the power to slice fatty acids off of triglycerides, slice the fatty acid off of cholesterol ester, which would change CE, cholesterol ester, into free cholesterol. Good news, because that's the only cholesterol that the intestine can recognize and pull in. People who have pancreatic problems, they don't make enough lipases, these fatty acid esters pass right through them. They have malabsorption, they have fatty diarrhea. So that would be in the most extreme form. But we all have different genetics and we all manufacture lipases to varying degrees. So different individuals have different ability to de some of the things you're eating and that's going to affect absorption of both fatty acids and cholesterol ester. Okay, so uh, I'm eating an egg. Most of the cholesterol in there is cholesterol ester. It's in the yolk and it's going to go down. And if my pancreas is working, some of that cholesterol ester will be de into free cholesterol. That that is not is going to pass right through me because it's just too big. The intestine has no receptor that can attach to cholesterol ester and pull it in. But the receptor in the lining of the enterocyte does have the ability to recognize unesterified cholesterol. So when cholesterol ester comes down and it's deesterified into free cholesterol, it's going to be in the proximal, that's the beginning part of the small intestine. And then the intestine has a decision to make, wow, this person just ate, there's a lot of stuff in that gut lumen. There are fatty acids, there's cholesterol, there's glucose, there's a lot of stuff that this person eat. So I now have to decide what to absorb. All right, so the intestine is looking at the gut lumen and it sees free cholesterol now. If I could take one of those little submarines and go right down your esophagus, stomach into the intestine, and I could start interviewing cholesterol molecules. And I went up to each and every cholesterol molecule, and there would be bazillions of them sitting in your gut lumen, but I'm going to interview them one at a time. And I would say, Mr. Cholesterol, Mrs. Cholesterol, can I ask you, 
where the heck did you come from? How did you wind up in this person's intestine? And that cholesterol molecule would say, well, he ate an egg and he swallowed me and here I got steatosterified separated and here I am. And you know what? About 20 to 25% of the cholesterol molecules I interview in the gut lumen would give me that answer. Well, if you know how to do math, you would say, wait a minute, maybe 20 to 25% of the cholesterol molecules were ingested. That means 75, 80, even 90% did not come through this human's mouth. How did they get into the small intestine? All the intestine knows is if I see free cholesterol, I might absorb it. It could care less how you got into the small intestine. So a little bit comes from what we ate. The overwhelming vast majority, there's another entrance to the small intestine. It has nothing to do with your mouth or esophagus. As you know, Gil, as a doctor, uh, the, our intestine is connected to our insides via a passageway from the liver to the small intestine. And that's called our biliary system, our bile ducts. So the liver can take things it doesn't want, secrete it into the bile. Sometimes it's transiently stored in the gallbladder, but ultimately it will pass out of the gallbladder through our bile ducts and come out in the very early part of the small intestine and enter the lumen of the small intestine. So the truth is, that 75 to 90% of the free cholesterol molecules, those are the only absorbable molecules that are in our small intestines at any given time of the day, came via the liver and the bile duct. They did not come from our mouth. And in general, that is why the amount of cholesterol you eat, for the most part, and there are exceptions, has nothing to do with the bulk of cholesterol that's going to be absorbed. The overwhelming majority of cholesterol that you and I are probably going to absorb during the day was produced in our body. It was shipped back to the liver, get rid of it. The liver pumped it into our bile ducts and it wound up in the intestine. And the liver and our insides are hoping, God, I hope that intestine excretes this unneeded cholesterol into the stool. The cholesterol ain't, or the intestine isn't that bright. So the cholesterol. X amount is going to be absorbed. So the majority of the cholesterol molecules that make up the pool of absorbable cholesterol have endogenous, meaning they were synthesized in your body and shipped back to the small intestine. Yes, some of the cholesterol you uh, ate is going to be in that pool and is available for absorption. But in general, seven to eight out of 10 cholesterol molecules in your small intestine, you didn't eat. They were put there by your body. So that's why eating cholesterol is not a major league player on however much cholesterol you're going to have in the tissues or in the blood of your body. But it's always more complicated, isn't it? So the next thing I'm going to talk about is, all right, how does that intestine decide? Let's let some of this free cholesterol in. Well, it has to have... It doesn't diffuse through the uh, intestinal membrane. There are molecules that can diffuse right in, but cholesterol, lipids in general cannot. We have specific receptors that bind to, recognize the lipids, and pull them through the enterocyte cell membrane and up before you know it's inside the cell or the enterocyte. So we have one receptor that has the ability to recognize quote unquote sterols. That means anything that has the sterile structure, it would recognize, but it's constructed so it has an incredible affinity to recognize cholesterol. It has very little affinity to recognize phytosterols that you may have eaten in your veggies. It might recognize a few and pull them in, but very few if you have the perfect receptor. And let's give that receptor a name. It's a mouthful. It's the Neiman Pick C1 like one, Neiman Pick C1 like one protein. So if I express that receptor, it's going to recognize mostly cholesterol, a few phytosterol molecules, and it's going to grab them and pull them inside the enterocyte cell. That's step one of absorption going from the gut lumen into the gut cell, the small intestinal cell. All the lipid absorption is long before this stuff ever gets down to the colon. This is all the early part of the small intestine where most lipid absorption occurs. 
but it, you know, the small intestine is 20, 30 feet long. So it's got a lot of surface area to do that, but it's in the beginning third or half where most cholesterol gets in. All right, and maybe some phytosterols. A little bit of a side, because is there anything that regulates how much Neiman pick C1 like one an intestinal cell may produce? Number one is yeah, your genes. There's a very specific gene that if you have will produce the proper number of Neiman pick C1 like proteins. But what if something went wrong or maybe something went right? For some reason, you inherited the genes where you don't make very many Neiman pick C1 like proteins. That's called a loss of function. Good news, if you don't make very many Neiman pick C1 like proteins, you are what is called a hypo underabsorber of cholesterol. Wow. So you're actually denying the body a source of cholesterol. Here's even the better news. Throughout life, those people's cholesterol as measured in the blood might be 15 to 25% lower than people who have proper Neiman pick function. But you would think that little change in serum cholesterol doesn't matter. Over a lifetime, they have almost no heart disease whatsoever. So blocking absorption of cholesterol genetically is a gift from God because you will have a much lower incidence of ever, ever having atherosclerosis in your body. All right. But there's going to be another part of this receptor that we'll get to. So, but anyway, hope you are born with loss of function of the Neiman pick C1 like protein. So if we did cholesterol absorption studies in most humans, let's say in the middle is 50%. That means you will absorb 50% of the free cholesterol molecules that make it into your gut lumen. That's on average what a normal human will absorb. And we're only talking cholesterol here, not fat, not saturated fat, cholesterol. There are about 20% of people, most of them because of that loss of function of Neiman pick C1 like one, who are these hypoabsorbers of cholesterol. But on the other end, there's about 20, 25% of people that are overabsorbers of cholesterol. And guess what? They are the people who are going to correlate with increased cholesterol in the serum and possibly oftentimes increase incidence of coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis. So when people ask me, does it matter whether I eat cholesterol or not? I said, you know, I can only answer that question if I knew, are you a hypo absorber, an average absorber, or a hyper absorber? If you're a hypo absorber, eat 42 eggs a day. It doesn't matter. Most of it is not going to get in. But if you even have a little bit of hyperabsorption, that's probably the person we're going to advise. Back off the cholesterol a bit in your diet, and you can play it and see how it affects. So that's the only way to answer that question. You cannot make a general statement, eating cholesterol is bad because it's going to get in. And some people it will get in, and many people it will not. And some people will never get in. So you and very few of us are checking our genetic function of the Neiman pick C1 like protein. But there is a blood test, and I'll get to it in a moment, that could tell me or you as doctors that, oh boy, this is a person who is either oversynthesizing internally cholesterol molecules in their cells, or this is a person who's, for a variety of reasons, is overabsorbing cholesterol. You know, Gil, and you give way better dietary advice than I ever do. Whatever dietary advice you're going to suggest to a patient, you're individualizing it for that given human based on so many things you found in the history, their nutritional history, their biomarkers that you're checking in the blood. So in most of those, I don't think we have to shove down everybody's throat. You can only eat 200 milligrams of cholesterol a day because the, the amount of cholesterol you're eating may have nothing to do with your atherosclerotic. But there are some who would. Hmm. So you can do it by trial and error. Look, you're not measuring phytosterols or genetic tests for hyperabsorption. You, they have a high ApoB LDL cholesterol. You could, you want to give them two months of stop eating cholesterol and see what happens. Okay, yeah. no harm done. Yeah. So many doctors will do it that way. I'm just a lipidologist. I notice stuff. I know how to use biomarkers. 
So you will get a more serious, thorough, comprehensive exam from me. Other clinicians will say, oh my God, what a waste of time and money. You don't need them on everybody. So, and right. look, I'm the guy who wrote the chapters on this stuff. So I've spent a lifetime studying sterile yeah. homeostasis. Well, that's why we have you on. All right, the next step, I'm a free cholesterol. Neiman Pick has pulled me in. That intestine is going to say, either we do need some of this cholesterol to get inside, to get internalized, or oh, good God, we don't need any more cholesterol. We have to get rid of the cholesterol that the Neiman Pick C1 like protein allowed in. So, as I said, there's several forces at play. The Neiman pick is what we call a cholesterol influx protein. It brings cholesterol from the gut lumen into the enterocyte. There's a parallel receptor that sits very close to it on the cell membrane between the enterocyte and the gut lumen, exact place where the Neiman pick also sits, but they're different receptors. This receptor is called the ATP binding cassette transporter, G5 or G8. There are two of them. They work together conjointly if they're working properly. And what the purpose of that receptor is, the intestinal cell says, oh my God, we got to, we absorb too much cholesterol through the Neiman pick. We're, we're not going to let it go inside. We're going to evict it right back to the gut lumen. And they turn on the genes that express ATP binding cassette transporters, G5 and G8. So if too many cholesterol molecules pass from gut lumen into the anthracite, they can be immediately re-evicted right back to the gut lumen, in which case then they will pass through the rest of your intestine and be excreted in the stool. So you can see what is the major regulator of cholesterol absorption is going to be a wonderful joint action of the Neiman pick C1 pulling it in and the ABC G5 G8 evicting it. If they're working in harmony, we will wind up with the proper amount of cholesterol that our body was hoping would be absorbed. But if we have defects in Neiman Pixi, one like one, or if you have loss of function of ABC, G5, G8, you got the wrong genes again, any cholesterol that gets into your enterocyte has little ability to be evicted back to the gut lumen, then it is gonna wind up in your body because it's gotta go somewhere. So you have this happy interplay of G5 and G8. As a quick little aside, because the body just so tightly regulates cholesterol absorption, the liver was also given a set of G5, G8 and Neiman Pick C1 like one. So if phytosterols ever wind up in your liver because somehow they pass through the intestine, or if you even absorb too much cholesterol, the liver has a defense. <laughs> you thought you were going to get in. I'm going to evict you through the ABC G5 G8 right back to the bile. And you're going right back to the intestine, buddy. It's like a backup door bouncer. You may have gotten through the first bouncer, the G5 G8, and even pick in the intestine. But the odds are less you're going to get through the liver because the liver will recognize you as fraudulent and express them. Now, there are a lot of people who don't have total loss of it, but they have mm. partial loss of G5, G8. So they're not going to super absorb a few more phytosterols than usual to get in. If we measure that, we know the system is broken, and that's how phytosterols measured in the blood have clinical value. But remember, the ABC, G5, G8 also evicts extra cholesterol that the intestine doesn't want, or even the liver. If the liver's got too much cholesterol, get it out of here. I'm putting you right back in the bile and I'm sending you down to the intestine again. So if you have partial loss of function of ABC, G5 or G8, you are going to be one of those 80% hyperabsorbers of cholesterol or maybe more. You might be a 95%. If you do have a loss of function of ABC, G5, G8, you are going to have too much cholesterol in your system, probably have a high ApoB level. And it's very treatable hyperabsorption of cholesterol. So it's crucial for a clinician to know that. If for some reason you, you did a genetic testing and it, and it indicates a lo partial loss of function of G5, G8, the odds are huge you're going to need an ApoB lowering therapy that blocks the absorption of cholesterol. And uh, doctors know, and many patients know, that's a drug called ezetimibe or 
originally sold the Zedia. If people don't have uh, that, that genetic test result, the poor man's test would be to just measure their uh, blood cholesterol levels or their ApoB or their LDL cholesterol, and then try to eat a few eggs, uh, maybe a couple eggs a day, and then measure well, again. Well, yeah, uh, but there's a better way of doing it. There's a blood test that's going to tell us, not a genetic test, which are more expensive, harder to find, but a simple blood test that would tell us, oh my God, you're absorbing too much cholesterol. On that, almost as always due to loss of function of G5, G8, not excess function of Neiman PIX E1 like one. Mm -hmm. Before I tell you about that test, now I've told you how free cholesterol gets in or gets out of the enterocyte. But now the enterocyte has a, a pool of cholesterol that it finds acceptable, but it knows it has to get it into the body. It either has to be delivered to this tissue or that tissue, or most of it's going to go to the liver, and then the liver can decide what to do with the absorbed cholesterol. So how does cholesterol now get from the cytosol, this inside of the enterocyte, into the liver? Well, it has to be put in something that's going to take it out of the enterocyte, take it through some circulatory pathway, and dump it in the liver. The enterocyte says, all right, give me X glob of cholesterol. Give me X glob of triglycerides. I'll make an oil droplet. Now all I have to do is wrap them with a protein, and I've created a lipoprotein. It happens to be one of the ApoB family of lipoproteins. And the big, and it's a big one, it's our biggest lipoprotein by far, is produced in the intestine. It is called a chylomicron which the intestine then just secretes into something called our lymphatic system. It's a different type of circulatory system that connects cells with the blood. So the chylomicrons get poured out of the intestine into the lymphatics. It's a short journey. Our lymphatics enter the bloodstream at, you know, up in our neck. So those chylomicrons take a sub pathway to get to the bloodstream, the lymphatic system, now, the big purpose of that giant chylomicron carrying energy, triglycerides, is to rapidly rush to muscle cells or adipocytes, the two tissues that express an enzyme that sucks those triglycerides right out. Now, when I take a big tri uh, chylomicron and I remove a large chunk of its triglycerides, it becomes a much smaller chylomicron that's called the chylomicron remnant. The liver has receptors that recognize chylomicron remnants and pull that now reduced but still large chylomicron molecule into the liver. And what's on the inside of that chylomicron remnant? That's how the cholesterol goes from your intestine to your liver. It co-shares space with triglycerides. The triglycerides are removed by muscles or fat cells. The remaining shrunken chylomicron or remnant delivers the cholesterol to the liver. Now the liver says, ha ha, I have a nice supply of intestinally absorbed cholesterol. Now it's up to me to decide what to do with that. The liver will also be synthesizing some cholesterol and the two pools mix. And then the liver decides what to do with both synthesized and absorbed cholesterol. All right, but let's go right back to the intestine. I told you, all right, step one is to throw the cholesterol ester and triglycerides inside a chylomicron, ship it out. There's still some remaining uh, free cholesterol molecules there that have not been esterified. Pathway two, how cholesterol exits the enterocyte is not going into a chylo, much of it does, but there's a backdoor exit going into an HDL particle. One of the crude signs that a doctor can look at in the bloodstream that at least it suggests I might be dealing with a hyperabsorber of cholesterol is their HDL cholesterol is tending high because the HDLs are acquiring extra cholesterol molecules at the small intestine. Most of the cholesterol in HDL comes out of your liver, but X amount comes out of the intestine, especially if you're a hyperabsorber. So it's a real poor man's clue that if I see, geez, LDL cholesterol is up, but your HDL cholesterol is up too. At least think of hyperabsorption of cholesterol. You see a man with an HDL cholesterol of 60? That's unusual. 70? God, what's going on here? Maybe you want to check absorption in that man. 
a mm. lady would be a little bit higher because as you know, women have slightly higher HDL cholesterols than do men, but it's a poor man surrogate of hyperabsorption of cholesterol. I've already talked about it, but there is a third way that that enterocyte can get rid of unwanted cholesterol. So chylomicron's one, lipidate HDL's two, but remember, it could send any unwanted free cholesterol right back out through the ABCG5 8 back to the lumen of the intestine, and we can kiss it goodbye. Are there ways that the intestine can prevent any free cholesterol molecules from attaching to the neiman pick c one like protein? Yes. The intestine is full of what? Tons of flora, microbes, bacteria. And bacteria, we're learning more and more, regulate many homeostatic mechanisms in the human body. So guess what? We have some bacterial species that have the ability to take that free cholesterol, put it through a chemical reaction, Cholesterol changes into a group of molecules called a stanol. And here's the wonderful thing about that little bacterial trick. The neiman pick c one like protein has almost no ability to recognize a stanol. So you were, if those bacteria do us the favor and change cholesterol to cholestanol, it's going to go right at your rear end. So that's another bodily defense about regulating cholesterol. There are lactobacilli products, commercial products that we consider sort of like a yogurt that you can swallow. And their lactobacilli are the ones that convert cholesterol to cholesterol. <laughs> so that can be one of these. I hate to recommend supplements because you really never know what the hell is in any given supplement you're buying, but a reputable lactobacillus product is a nowhere near as potent as Zeti or Zetamide but it is a way of reducing cholesterol absorption. It's a capsule full of a ton of these phytosterols that I mentioned, way more than even a vegetarian eats in a day. You know, a couple of grams of phytosterols, a vegan might eat 600 milligrams of phytosterols a day. And on the premise that if you swallow a lot of exogenous phytosterols, they will compete with cholesterol for absorption into your enterocyte. So you will probably absorb a little bit less cholesterol. And you know what? That would be fine and dandy unless you're one of those ABC G5, G8 loss of functions, because you're going to create not true phytosterolemia, but a serious phytosterol level in your blood. And once a threshold is crossed, phytosterols have the potential in some people to do bad things. So before I let anybody go to a supplement store and let some kid behind a counter sell them phytosterol supplements, I would prefer to measure phytosterols in the blood. And if I can see they're a hyperabsorber, I tell them, pretend that's arsenic, never buy that product because it can't possibly do you any good mm. over time. So another important thing to know there are out there, not everybody knows about them, but I told you stanols cannot be absorbed. So if you're looking for a supplement that will compete with cholesterol for absorption, but it itself cannot be absorbed, the phytosterol might be, depending on your G5, G8. They're called, uh, there's one phytosterol product I know available on the market. It's called Benicol. It's a phytostanol. It's a specifically made product. It used to be made in Finland. And I've you go on Amazon, you can buy it. I think in a grocery store, we used to see it all the time. Uh, that's one of these supplemental ways to, if you want to start uh, addressing uh, hyperabsorption of cholesterol. But I would tell you, if your ApoB is seriously high, go right to Zeti or Zetabide. You know. So even though it can't get, get absorbed by the Neiman pick, it can compete with cholesterol yes. and trick yes. the, the Neiman pick. Yes. It's okay. similar enough in structure to a, cholesterol that it fakes out the mm. neiman pick so and the other thing all of the lipids i mentioned fatty acids cholesterol when they're sitting as a pool in our intestine there's actually another component that rounds them all up and sort of acts like a ferry boat and brings them to the intestine for absorption and that is bile acids that our liver makes secretes through the bile bile acids 
ground up lipids into little collections called biliary micelles. They're little ferry boats full of lipids. They almost are like a lipoprotein, but there's no proteins on them. And they traffic cholesterol, sterols, fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, phospholipids to the brush border of the intestine where the Neiman pick can grab them. So there is sort of an intermediate. So the phytostanol really blocks cholesterol from going into the biliary micelle. And this, that gets in there. And when it docks at the enterocyte, the Neiman pick doesn't absorb the phytostanol and there's less cholesterol in the biliary micelle. So you reduce cholesterol absorption. It's kind of cool. It's weak, but it's an option. You know, if you're one of those FH patients who had your bypass, I mean, you want to take a phytostan, I'll be my guest, but you're never going to get ApoB to control with a supplemental product. Like that, that alone, yeah. So if you understand those concepts, and I'm a doctor and I would really love to know who's a hyperabsorber of cholesterol, because I have, if you're in a certain high risk zone or you're ApoB, we discussed that last time, have too many particles carrying cholesterol and we want to get rid of them, we do turn to pharmacological treatment sometimes if lifestyle hasn't corrected the issue. All right. So how would I know, Gil, whether you're a hyperabsorber or even a hypersynthesizer of cholesterol? Well, remember, if, if we eat vegetables, phytosterols should pass right through us if we have normal absorption. Maybe just a few phytosterols will make it into the intestinal cell. Most of them will be evicted right back out to the gut lumen. But if we tend to absorb more phytosterol molecules than we should, and that's because you at least have some degree of loss of function of ABC, G5, G8. It might only be minute. It might be horrific. Phytosterols are going to get into your chylomicrons or they're going to be evicted into your HDL particles. If phytosterols enter your chylomicron, they're brought to the liver. The liver exports lipids by making VLDLs and LDLs. And all of a sudden, your VLDLs and LDLs are carrying phytosterols when they never should. And the HDL is now circulating, carrying something it should never carry, phytosterols. So if you and I measure phytosterols in the bloodstream, the simple blood samples we take out of our patient's arm, and we tell the lab, measure phytosterols, there might be a trivial amount. Okay, a few molecules make it in. That means nothing. It means you're basically a normal absorber. But as those phytosterol levels start to go up, up, up to different thresholds, it's a major league clue that I'm dealing with a person who has hyperabsorption of phytosterols. Even though it's a small degree, anybody who's hyperabsorbing a phytosterol is way more seriously absorbing cholesterol because the Neiman pick has a much greater affinity for cholesterol than phytosterols. So if you and I measure phytosterols in the two that are usually measured in the bloodstream, and you got to go to certain laboratories that do these, not every lab in America will offer them. So it's an advanced test. Some doctors like Gil knows about them, other no clue. A lipidologist usually know how to get this stuff if they want it. The two major phytosterols that laboratories have the ability to measure are something called cytosterol or campesterol, C-A-M-P-E-S, sterol. So if I measure cytosterol or campesterol, most labs do both, and they're elevated, you're dealing with hyperabsorption of cholesterol. The next test, you've probably already done an ApoB level, and you're saying, oh my God, the ApoB, the particle number is too high here. This person's at risk for uh, the sterile molecules being delivered to the artery wall. And my therapeutic mission is to clear those ApoB particles by inducing LDL receptors in the liver. A hyperabsorber, the best, a really effective either monotherapy or an add on therapy is let's add Zetia or Zetamide. Swallow it, you stop absorbing to a large degree, not totally cholesterol. Your liver is denied a source of cholesterol. The liver makes more of those LDL receptors that clear your ApoB particles. ApoB is the goal of therapy, but we measure phytosterols to give us a clue. I now understand the pathologic mechanism that might be at play in a given individual. 
And understanding that may help me make a smarter therapeutic choice if I have to choose a drug in this person. Now, many doctors just, they usually get down, oh, I'm going to start with a statin. If it doesn't work or I don't get where I want it, I'll add Zetamib or Zetia to it. Personally, I would rather you know that ahead of time because I think there are many people who would benefit just taking a Zetamib or a Zetia and may not need a statin. The nightmare cases will need a statin added to a Zetamib. Some of them will need even a third drug that further clears ApoB particles, the PCSK9s. But it's nice to know, step one, which drug has the best chance of working. At the end of the day, you don't have to listen to a word you and I talked about. Measure ApoB in your blood. If it's above a certain level, do what you can do to increase hepatic liver clearance of those ApoB particles. Here's a lifestyle that might work in person A or person B, and they might be different lifestyles. And here are, basically, we have four drugs that can enhance clearance of ApoB mm. particles. Cholesterol synthesis inhibitors, cholesterol blocker, uh, absorption blocker inhibitors, LDL receptor regulator drugs like the PCSK9, and a rarely used drug anymore, used in my heyday, but rarely used anymore, the bile acid sequestrants. Uh, for those who need pharmacologic lowering of ApoB, I prefer to do what we call optimize our lipid therapy, not drown you with a statin at a higher, higher, higher dose, then go to plan B, add a Zetia, then go to plan C, add benpidoic acid, then throw a PCSK9 inhibitor at you. The first step I think ought to be a, a dual ApoB lowering therapy. And here's why. Say I do the blood tests on you and it shows Gil's mostly a hypersynthesizer of cholesterol. That's why his ApoB is high. Well, logic tells me just give Gil a statin because that would stop cholesterol synthesis to a large degree and it'll have a nice impact on his ApoB. But is there a downside to just inhibiting cholesterol synthesis? And vice versa, suppose I found out you're a hyperabsorbia, I'm going to give you Zetia monotherapy because it'll block absorption. I'll get a nice drop in your ApoB. But what are the long-term consequences of uh, inhibition of cholesterol synthesis or inhibition of cholesterol absorption? And X number of people, and it's going to vary on your genes, if I take out cholesterol synthesis with a statin, mm -hmm. those forces are going to go into play. The body knows, oh my God, we've lost the ability to synthesize cholesterol. I have to get it somewhere else. So your intestine reflexly starts absorbing cholesterol. So one downside or statins would be more efficacious if they didn't cause some degree of hyperabsorption of cholesterol. Vice versa, if I gave you only Zetia and blocked your absorption, all of a sudden your body says, God, we're not absorbing cholesterol anymore. So what? I'll just start rev up the synthesis and I'll make more. So Zetia monotherapy turns on cholesterol synthesis genes. But if you want to really outsmart the homeostatic system, prescribe a low dose, smallest dose possible of a statin with Zetia, off-label, but you can even use Zetia every other day you will block synthesis to a certain extent, absorption to a certain extent. You, it's the initial way to maximally up regulate your LDL receptors, which clear your LDL mm. particles. So there's a lot of tricks to the trade. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of the main points. Most of our dietary cholesterol is in the esterified form, so it's bound to a fatty acid. So that's a large molecule that can't get absorbed by the intestine in that form. However, a minority of the cholesterol in our food is in the unesterified form. And of the fraction that is esterified, at least some of that can get de-esterified in the gut by that lipase that Tom talked about. So the cholesterol we eat can potentially be absorbed and influence our blood cholesterol levels and our ApoB levels, that's been shown as well. But in most people, that's going to be a very modest effect, a small effect. Analyses estimate that in average, going from zero cholesterol in the diet to one egg would result in about a 7.7 .7 milligrams per deciliter rise in LDL cholesterol. And the effect plateaus at around 
10 milligrams per deciliter, give or take. So going from one egg to two, three, four eggs would result in a very small additional increase. So this means that for most people, there are gonna be much stronger factors determining your blood cholesterol levels, even dietary factors, saturated fat, the amount of fiber in your diet, those are gonna be much stronger levers on your serum cholesterol level than how much cholesterol you're eating. And for those hypo absorbers, those 20 to 25% of people that absorb very little dietary cholesterol, that effect can be even smaller, it can be zero or close to zero. Whereas for the hyper absorbers, the people who absorb a lot, we can have a more meaningful effect that can make more of a difference. And I love that Tom covered this aspect of the individual variability because every time we talk about this topic, somebody will write in the comments, well, I eat 10 eggs a day and my cholesterol level is a dream. So the science is all wrong. And of course, somebody else will comment the opposite. I cut out eggs and my cholesterol dropped like a ton of bricks. So it's not true that it's a small effect. Nobody's lying. It's just that there's the individual variability. There's a distribution. For most people, it's a small effect. For some, it might be zero. And for some, it's going to be more substantial. Okay, how do you know which one you are? Three tests that we covered. The first one and the dirtiest one is your HDL cholesterol level. So if it's high, 60, 70 milligrams per deciliter or higher, you might be a hyper absorber. And I say might because many factors affect uh, HDL cholesterol level, right? So this test is far from definitive. It's just uh, really quick and dirty. It's a suggestion, it's a possibility. The second one is your LDL cholesterol or your ApoB level. If they're very high, especially if you notice a change, a substantial change, depending on how much cholesterol you eat, you might be a hyper absorber. And the third test, it's also the most rigorous, but also the least common and probably the hardest to procure is the level of phytosterols in your blood, specifically cytosterol and campesterol. So I hope that helps. Let me know your questions below. Take care. See you next time.